Hello, I'm John Nightingale, a director at JCT and the symposium host. Now the 25th JCT Traffic Signal Symposium was an online event this year and I'm delighted to bring you a recording of one of the presentations. Now these recordings would not have been possible without the support of a select group of our event partners. So our thanks go to the Institute of Highway Engineers, ITS UK, keepadistance.co.uk, Siemens Mobility, TWM, and of course, our media partner, Highways News. Please check out their short videos, which will tell you about some of the products and services that they can provide. Now, I hope you enjoy this presentation, and we would love to see you in person for our 25th anniversary event in Nottingham Trent University in September 2021. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks. John's given us a good introduction. So we're talking this morning about a trial that myself um, and Andrew's been involved in as well, looking at selective vehicle detection um, and how we can use that to improve mover uh, around HGV traffic. Uh, and those of you who are a technical players go, remember we wrapped into this with um, a colleague from Siemens called John Durdle, sorry, Jack Durdle, get his name right. Um, so this is a bit of a follow-up on that with a bit more evidence-based analysis around what we've found. So just to quickly set the scene for those of you who perhaps aren't familiar with the background or, or a reminder of those who were, um, we started looking at this problem, the fact that traffic signals by their nature, they, they stop traffic. Uh, it's a requirement to, to make the efficiencies that we, we get out of signals. Large vehicles obviously have a much bigger impact when they are stopped. Um, they take more energy, they create more, more brake dust, that kind of thing. And so it's advantageous to try and stop large vehicles less if we can. But traffic signal systems, including Mover, don't really look at different bus, uh, dif different vehicle types and therefore don't have any discrimination around large vehicles compared to other vehicles. We also have increasing difficulty around our networks where we need to find more capacity solutions but running out of space within the highways to do that. So we need to find other solutions to how we can improve our, our systems. So we started this whole journey out on a bit of a hypothesis uh, based on existing technology. We said, well, we can go and change what we do on a site with very simple changes in the control methodology and with the controller um, facilities to introduce some selective vehicle detection for heavy vehicles and change the way MOVE operates and give ourselves some improvements as a result of that. So we had to select a site to run this trial on uh, and the site we selected was the A52 Stragglethorpe Road Junction uh, near Nottingham. Now we chose this site because it's a relatively simple site, there's no external influence, no MOVE linking, um, it's, it's just somewhat complex but overall simple five-stage operation um, and critically for us it's adjacent to uh, an air quality management area site which is the properties you see on the bottom right hand side there um, and with that comes a permanent monitoring site which allows us to get lots and lots of data over a very long period of time to evaluate any impact we have on the air quality emissions in the area. The solution we actually employed was the Siemens SLD4 8 plus 1 detector pack. So they're replacement packs in the controller and they give us the opportunity to have, as well as a normal loop outputs, configurable outputs for selective detection off the loops. We also retained the existing diamond loops here. Um, two reasons. One is wanted to make sure that we could demonstrate, we could run this with minimal cost and minimal changes. There's no civil works involved at all in this trial. Um, and because we had a site where lens pin over the loops was very, very good, so we were confident that we could get a reasonable detection over diamond loops. Now, the, the Siemens units came pre-configured, and they're configured to rectangular loops from the, the original plant they over in Germany. But we're actually very, very pleased with how they performed, and they gave us um, very good detection of HGVs, with some small exceptions that some Luton vans and, and buses generally were always classed as HGVs, but that's probably not a bad thing in the context. So in terms of changes to the control system, we didn't change anything in the control spec other than adding in the new inputs. All the changes were made with the mover. And we trialed three different options initially, looking at um, how we might want to implement some sort of priority system. Options one and two were both very, very simple using priority links and mover. And effectively, if a vehicle was detected while on green, it would hold the green um, to let a vehicle clear <coughs> through within predefined maximums. Option three was a much softer approach using what we did, we dubbed ghost links, where every link in the, the system was duplicated and the duplicate links only received the input from the special, the special vehicle detection. That gives a much softer approach and allows us to change some things that move using the optimizer 
Um, but on test, object testing found that we didn't think it was that effective at ensuring that the, the vehicles were cleared through and not stopped towards the end of the green. And we were still making changes and stopping vehicles. So the option we ended up going for was option two. That was what we felt was the most effective at making sure that vehicles that arrived towards the end of what move would normally terminate uh, were actually being prioritized through and the system was holding green before it made a stage change to the following stage. So that's a quick background. Um, we have to Andrew now talking about some of the data we collected and how we've analysed it. Uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so um, we have access to, to a, a range of data sources. Um, the MOVA logs have um, stage duration and appearances. Um, we also have occupancy and hourly traffic counts from that as well. Um, we managed to get hold of some traffic survey data from an external contractor who um, they recorded each HTV stop and the duration of the stop and the, and the time of the data to stop. Um, there was also AMPR data, which um, we could track the journey time across the junction. Uh, we also had automatic traffic counters. Um, we've had some permanent traffic count sites, the, the Highways England traffic count sites, which, which are basically some loops in the road uh, at certain points in the network. Um, we also had air quality data, as Mark mentioned, there's an adjacent monitoring site, um, which allowed us to get air quality data. Uh, we also had uh, meteorological data involved to support, support that as well. Um, so coming from some of the results, um, we had concerns about the automatic traffic counter data. Um, it was showing uh, in one instance that HGV traffic had, had almost doubled, which um, clearly wasn't the case from, from other sources and from looking at the video footage. Um, ideally, we would have liked to use traffic data to calculate a range of HGV stops per vehicle, but um, due to this, this inaccuracy, we couldn't, couldn't rely on that data, we weren't able to. Um, there are other sources of data available for, for traffic, um, but there were issues with these, these also, which are, which are um, shown here on the slide. Um, so because we have no reliable source of traffic data, what it meant was we'd have to, to estimate traffic change uh, based on these, these sources. Uh, we, we think there was no more than a 5% increase between the two periods. Um, so just meant that we, we based the analysis on the assumption that there'd been no significant increase in traffic that would have had any impact on, on the results. Um, but wherever there was verification on the video for other trends, uh, I'd, I'd do a traffic count there just to make sure that this wasn't, wasn't a factor uh, in that. So the, the first bit of data we looked at um, got very, very easily and quickly was the, the mover data. Um, and it's very interesting findings we got from this very, very on, which I presented last time around as well. Um, the first thing is that we, we saw quite a, a notable change in the overall cycle times and in the stage durations uh, across throughout the day. Um, so if on the AC cycle times went up as well as stage one, stage two, um, stage two, which is the main side, so that also increased in duration uh, as well. So we can see quickly that mover is doing something different needed also changes we've made than it was doing before, despite the fact that flows have been fairly consistent. Similarly, we can get occupancy data out of the mover logs. Um, and that gives some very interesting uh, pictures we can look at. Uh, and here's a scatter plot showing all the different points from the, the before and the after periods that we've collected. And you can see generally that the, in the after data, the occupancy has increased overall on the junction uh, and particularly more so as the flows increase. Um, that suggests that vehicles are taking longer to cross the loops, either they're going slower or they're queuing longer on the loops, um, which would reflect a longer cycle time and therefore longer queues on red uh, during that period. One thing to note here is we've got a number of red dots on the left-hand side of the graph there, uh, which are significant outliers. Uh, now these all correspond to evening periods between sort of 7.30 p.m. and midnight, uh, and a week when there's roadworks at a downstream junction. Uh, and so we believe those are all down to things like TM vehicles crawling over or parking on loops or traffic being in a single lane um, from the upstream roadworks coming through into the junction in a different pattern than it would normally do so. So yes, yeah, so what we saw was that, that going westbound, um, there was actually an increase of 32% in HGV stops. Um, and there were increases observed across all hours of the day. Um, so looking at the, the duration of the stop, that actually, actually increased by four seconds um, between the two periods. Um, the most significant increases uh, happened in the morning and afternoon peaks um, with, with smaller increases in the uh, interpeak period. Um, so I had a look at the video footage uh, during the morning peak just to sort of see why, why there was this, this big increase um, in stop duration. Uh, it just showed a disproportionate increase in the time on red uh, during these sort of busy, busy hours. Um, so moving on to the eastbound, eastbound uh, traffic, um, 
so in the pre trial period, as Mark mentioned, there were, there were roadworks at the Easter Junction. Um, and looking at the video footage, there seemed to be occasional queuing across the junction um, around sort of 4 p.m., um, very short periods of around 4, 4 to 5 p.m. Um, so this may have inflated the, the reduction in stops um, going eastbound to about 13%. Um, although if we take out the, the, all the stops between 4 and 5 p.m., it's still, still a 10% reduction. So uh, we think there's a positive impact there, um, which is not quite sure exactly exactly how much those road works are, are impacting on that. Um, so in terms of the stop duration, there's no change. Obviously, there's a bit of variation across the day, but nothing significant. Um, overall, no, no change in stop duration. Um, and the ANPR data shows a very, a very slight increase in average journey time, um, which could be due to a number of, number of factors. Um, so moving on to the to the right turn, Eastburn round, round turn onto Strathall Road, um, there was a nine percent reduction in HGV stops there, um, with the reductions mostly occurring during the the interpeak period. Um, very little change outside that in the peak times. Um, the big difference was in the stop duration. We saw a significant increase during the morning peak. Um, there was also a significant increase in journey time uh, during the, the morning peak as well. Uh, so again, check the video footage for this um, uh, and look at the, the time with the longest, uh, biggest increase in stop duration journey time, uh, which was uh, 7 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. Um, it showed that waiting traffic wasn't clearing um, and in some instances actually waiting in the adjacent lane. And what we also saw was that there was an average increase in the time on red of 38 seconds, um, whereas there's an increase on green of, of uh, one second. So uh, a disproportionate increase in, in time on red. And again, when, when the junction was, was at its busiest. Um, uh, so again, moving on to, to some other observations. Um, so we didn't have any traffic survey data for the exit out of Strugglefoot Road due to the, the so few HGVs coming out of there. Um, but what we did see were increases in journey time, um, which were in line with increases at other parts of the junction and, and the sort of general increase in stage times. Um, we did have a positive impact on the weekends. We saw 30% reduction in HGV stops in both directions. Um, we saw a reduction in multiple stops, um, especially going westbound, um, and quite, went down quite a bit. Um, we had an increase in overnight stops going westbound. So we had an increase across um, all hours between midnight and 7 a.m. Um, with an overall increase of 65%. Um, so yeah, so overnight, um, quite an increase in overnight stops. Let's hear back to Mark. So, in terms of quality, um, so we've got quite a lot of data from their quality covering uh, about a year before and a year after, um, looking at the trends. Um, and the end of two days we got from the additional monitoring site showed there was a slight reduction in concentrations during the trial period compared to the before period. Um, but when we compare that to other similar sites nearby, a similar type of junctions with same um, data collection, they showed some reductions as well. So, against control sites, there was no notable observable change uh, as a result of the trial. And this is despite the fact that particularly on the uh, westbound approach, which is the one closest to the monitor site, we actually had an increase in HGV stops. Um, so that it's quite probable that the, the changes we've made haven't really affected the air quality output, um, but there's probably been a slight increase in a particular matter from brake dust and so on, as we're stopping HGVs more frequently than we perhaps were before, unfortunately. So come back to the hypothesis then, and, and to validate this, I've broken it down to several sections. Um, so there's some interesting results when we look at each bit uh, by component. So first of all, can we retrofit equipment? Well, we've shown that we can. Um, the Siemens FLD 48 plus one packs went in quite nicely. Um, they've influenced the controller, and we can see quite clearly we've had a different operation as a result of making those changes to the site. And in fact, that's the second point as well. Now, can we therefore reduce the stops for large vehicles? Now, this has been a mixed result we've had. Um, some approaches have seen quite clear increases. Some have seen slight decreases. Um, and one of the key points, um, which we forgot to mention earlier, was that on the, the right turn for the road, well, we have seen a reduction in stops during the, peak, during the interpeak period. We've also seen overall a reduction in the number of double stops. That's the vehicle that had to stop more than once before clearing through the signals. So overall, we've shown that we can be effective in some cases at reducing the number of stops. But similarly, it's very easy in this kind of system to actually have an overall negative result. And this is because by influencing the system to arbitrarily hold because of one HGV there, we're overriding Moomer's optimizer and taking away 
the efficient stops and delays optimization control that moving normally does. And by helping one vehicle get through on green, we're holding another approach on red and stopping other vehicles there. And overall, we've seen there's been a slight negative result on certain approaches, particularly those most critical at certain times. In terms of emissions and air quality, despite the changes we saw, we saw some quite significant changes in stops, we didn't see any significant change in the air quality data. And therefore, it's only fair to assume that even if we had an overall positive result, we wouldn't see enough of an impact on air quality to say that this actually is an air quality solution that we can implement elsewhere. Improving junction throughput is an open question. Because of the changes we've had, uh, both positive and negative, it's very hard to determine whether if we had just those positive elements, we would see an overall improvement in throughput. Um, that would have to be, have to be researched further to be able to evaluate and quantify that. And the same goes for fuel consumption. Um, we had assumed that if you reduce the number of stops, we will improve fuel consumption for HGVs. But again, we can't prove that from the evidence we have at this present time. So to conclude what we found then, we can get a clear benefit on these sorts of systems for HGVs, particularly where there's a big speed differential. The right turn turning into Stragglethorpe Road, HGVs and buses in particular have to slow down quite a lot to take the tight radius turn, whereas cars will tend to move much quicker. A mover will tend to gap seek in those, those cases and close the green. By having a priority extension, we can force mover to say, don't close that, it's an HGV that's causing that gap, hold green and let it clear through. And that actually helps the overall system efficiency quite a lot, we've seen. But where we have very long greens, high speeds, or very, very consistent um, speeds between HVs and other vehicles, we've actually found, found that optimizing um, or prioritizing HVs through has actually overall taken away most optimization and, and causes to have negative results on the system. Now, maybe if we could apply a soft system and was talked about earlier with the priorities options in Mover 8, maybe we could do something a bit more intelligent by nudging Mover's optimizer rather than imposing a forced extension that may not always be appropriate in a wider system. And just therefore to close off the story for everybody, um, Straggle Thought Road, we have a future scheme coming in here, um, looking at banning the U-turn so we can actually improve the efficiency of the junction uh, and overlap the, the right turn in the left turn out stages, stages two and three. Because that scheme is hopefully coming fairly soon, uh, we haven't done any further extension optimization of the junction. We've made a very simple change to remove the priority extensions of all apart from the right turn into the into side road, where we know we've got a benefit. And we hope to go back in in the near future as we do the, the changes to remove the, the U-turn, to look at reintroducing some extensions for the side road, where we can do a bit more uh, review and make sure they are providing a benefit, as well as looking at things like providing ghost links on the head stages on the A52, as well as possibly doing things around um, anything we can do if we introduce move eight in the future. Thank you, and I have good questions. <laughs>